really an empty airfield, an empty chemical weapons factory, and then say, see, we, sub we want Assad gone. And yet again and again, their actions have proven that, in fact, they want regime preservation. This is not something — they are not really concerned with the Syrian people's demands for the fall of regime. They're concerned with continuing the war on terror, which has been the operation of the United States since 2001. <laughs> Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Maine to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. As of April 18th, the Palestinian Ministry of Health reports that since the start of the Great Return March, Israelis have killed 33 Palestinians and wounded an astounding 4,297. Over 1,500 were shot with regular bullets and over 400 with rubber-coated bullets. One assumes this was all done by IDF snipers perched on man-made hills around the fenced-in Gaza Strip. An injury is not as bad as death, of course, but considered. A Palestinian hospital on Thursday amputated the left leg of Abdul Rahman Nofal from the Sairat refugee camp. He was shot in that leg by an explosive bullet when he was engaged in a protest near the fence around Gaza. Nofal is 13 years old. Something that is not being reported is the disciplined support of the Great Return March among all the factions in Gaza. There have been stones thrown and tires burned, but not one rocket has been shot from all the Gaza Strip during this march. For all those like New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, who's been demanding a Palestinian Gandhi, witness and extol the thousands of Palestinians engaged in Gandhian nonviolent protest, or else choke on your hypocrisy. We start with Israeli violence against an unusual target, religious Israeli Jews. A sizable minority among the ultra-Orthodox in Israel reject the Zionist state and believe that a man-made attempt to make a Jewish state is religious heresy. They reject the right of the Israeli state to draft young people. On April 15th, a crowd of protesters blocked the entrance to the IDF recruiting office on Rashi Street in Jerusalem, trying to prevent the transfer of a religious Jewish girl named Yuval Dadon to military prison for her refusal to serve in the Israeli army. Police use high-pressure water cannons, horses, and stun grenades.
On April 20th, a day that most Israeli Jews celebrate as Independence Day, anti-Zionist religious activists in the United States will hold a protest in front of the Israeli embassy in New York City and then a march to the office of the Friends of the Israeli Defense Forces, which is across the street from Grand Central Terminal. The IDF Friends Group collects money from people in the U.S. to pay for programs to entertain Israeli soldiers who get too stressed out from shooting Palestinians. The protesters will be holding this banner, which shows injuries they say were inflicted on the religious Jews in Jerusalem on April 15th. On April 12th, Trump sent missiles into three targets in Syria he claimed were connected to chemical weapons production. An important section of the left had been planning major anti-war rallies in 25 cities for the weekend of the 13th. So they made opposition to this missile strike, a major theme, and sounded the alarm for possible World War III. The rallies were a flop. The one in Washington, D.C. looked to have 60 people. The biggest was in New York City, maybe 400 people. I think this is a profound rejection of the anti-war activists who are trapped in 2003 and think that the only brutal force out there is the U.S. Empire. Take a look at the flags held at this rally in New Haven on the 13th in this brief video clip. In that protest, a man is holding a flag of Putin's Russia and of the Assad dictatorship. Think about it. These two forces have bombed Syrians unmercifully, schools, hospitals, whatever. Assad has hideous prisons with tens of thousands of people. But it doesn't occur to these anti-war peace types that it's obscene to have their flags at an anti-war rally. Nor do they recognize that Trump's action on the 12th was extremely limited. 
the Syrian bases or factories were empty. Not even the Assad government claims that anyone was killed. Democracy Now! this last week had some very interesting guests talking about Syria. The first was the morning before the latest U.S. missile strike. Yazan al-Sadi, a Syrian-Canadian writer and researcher. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Yazan. Your response to all the latest developments in Syria. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is how surreal this is, even this interview, because, uh, Amy, the first time I was on Democracy Now! was almost a year ago this exact situation appearing itself. So it just struck me, and I feel I have to say that uh, Karl Marx was right, history repeats, and it was a tragedy, a farce, and it's even more absurd. There's just so much to say. I mean, my first comment I would like to really point out is this weird discussion happening in the U.S. as if an attack on Syria hasn't happened by the U.S. and by others. Let's remind everyone that the U.S. is striking Syria already. You have more than 2,000 soldiers on the ground. There are bases. For me as a Syrian, I see it as an occupation, just like how I see the Russians are an occupation on the country. So I just find the whole discussion that's happening is so absurd. And I feel like the hysteria that is being manufactured, in my opinion, by these politicians are just distracting from the core issues. And the core issues, at least to me, is accountability for Syrians. I mean, let's be honest, whether the U.S. strikes Syria, and here I believe people mean the Syrian military or the Syrian regime, how is this going to bring justice? How is this accountability in any way? Because it's not. And even then, what's next? What's the plan here? So I think the biggest issue that is really driving all this is that this is another example of the complete dysfunctionality and failure of the international political and accountability system. That this is what we're witnessing again and again, and we're seeing it in Syria, and we've seen it in so many other places around the world. And it's just, it's become very, Absurd, and it's become, and it's also as a human being. I mean, I just am so personally upset as a human, as I can. You know, I have to be empathetic here because people are dying in the scheme of things: men, women, children. They are being killed predominantly by the ones that have the most power, i.e., the regime and its allies. And they all are also being killed and harmed and abused by armed opposition groups who are backed by other superpowers. So that's where we're at. And, and these theater plays, these, these things that happen over an, an alleged chemical attack, and I personally believe it happened, and I believe I have my thoughts and my conclusions on who the culprit are based on the evidence that we all have around. Who do you believe? Really, who do you believe uh, launched this who attack? I, who, do I think, who do I think launched the attack based on the evidence that is around? based on trends, based on history, based on co context, I do think it was the Syrian regime. However, what does this change anything? Because, okay, the OPCW is currently investigating in the country, and they should start on Saturday. And I support that. I believe in an investigation. There has to be some sort of accountability here. I don't believe in a Western invasion and overthrow of the Syrian regime, because I don't think that leads to Syrian de 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 determination. However, how does this change anything? Because the OPPCW uh, has already said in previous reports that it has linked the Syrian regime to chlorine, a, a chlor attacks, at least three of them. It has also pointed out there are links of ISIS using mustard gas. So what are we arguing here? Are we arguing that chemical weapons are happening in Syria? Well, they are. People are using chemical weapons. They're using chemical agents whether it's uh, chlorine or anything else. What changes? This doesn't, it ignores the fact that the most deaths are happening through conventional means. Mm. People are dying because of airstrikes, bullets, sieges. 
So this idea of chemical weapons is also, so, it's absurd. So, Yazan, um, for people who aren't aware, OPCW is the Organization for the Prohibition yeah. of Chemical Weapons. But I wanted to go to Russia's foreign minister rejecting the allegations of the chemical weapons attack in Duma. Doctors, chemical defense specialists, have been to Duma where chemical weapons were allegedly used, but they found no traces of such use, no casualties or victims of this mythical chemical attack. The West stubbornly refuses to listen to a heap of information. Mm. Um, France says they have evidence that it was the Syrian government, but today the German foreign minister, Heiko Maas, said Western countries must increase pressure on Russia in order to solve the crisis in Syria. We want these people to be held criminally responsible internationally, and there remains a lot to be done. The repeated use of chemical weapons, which is internationally prohibited, cannot come without consequences. You cannot just continue with the daily agenda. This now needs to be discussed with our Western partners. So Germany says they wouldn't get involved with England, with uh, Britain and France and the United States with an attack. And Yazan, your response to the Russians uh, saying it's not them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that the Russians would take this line, just like I'm not surprised about the Western government's line. I mean, you know, a lot of people point to the example of what happened with Iraq, and I agree that, you know, uh, what happened with Iraq is criminal. And this idea of manufacturing evidence. But there are two things I want to point out. Does this mean that if the U.S. was actually telling the truth, and there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Does this justify the killing of over a million Iraqis and the destruction of Iraq? Is this what people are arguing? Because that's what I'm hearing. Secondly, the position of manufacturing or victim blaming isn't really new. All regimes, whether they are the Russians, the Syrians, the Israelis, the Saudis, the Americans, say the same thing, and they've said the same thing throughout history. A lot of people say, remember Iraq. I also say, true, and I agree, remember Iraq. And also remember things like Guernica, where the fascist government at the time, during the Spanish Civil War, completely denied what happened to Guernica and said it was fabricated and that the uh, uh, anarchists and leftists were bombing and burning themselves. Mm. So this is, this is the situation. Let's all agree, and let's be frank. Mm. They're all lying in many ways to us. Yeah. They then Syrian American Rama Kudaimi. She's a member of DC's Syria Solidarity Collective and on the National Committee of the War Resisters League. First respond to the attack that took place this weekend on Syria, US, France, and Britain. Thank you, Amy, for having me on. Um, I think my first reaction when I heard these strikes were happening was, well, what's new? Uh, there's been airstrikes against Syria by the Assad regime, by the United States, by Russia, by a whole slew of actors for years now, um, since 2012, since the people rose up against the re brutal regime of Assad and demanding their freedom and dignity. And so it was kind of infuriating to see this being presented as breaking news, this being presented as an apocalypse that we're about to embark on World War III, especially as has been made clear again and again by the U.S. actions is and words is that this was something very limited, just to kind of send a message to Bashar al-Assad that you can go on and kill people with barrel bombs, with, with anything, but don't limit your use of chemical weapons. I want to turn to uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. Um, in an interview with Fox News on Sunday, she outlined President Trump's objectives in Syria and said U.S. troops would remain until these objectives are met. He had three major um, goals that he wanted to accomplish. He, one, wanted to make sure that chemicals, um, chemical weapons were not used or weapons of mass destruction were not used in any way that could harm American national interest. He wanted to make sure that we defeated ISIS completely and wholly to make sure that all of that threat was gone because it is a threat to American national interests. And he wanted to make sure that we had um, good grounds to watch what Iran was doing. And they weren't making a lot of aggressive headway in terms of that, because Iran is a national threat to American interests. And so I think that, no, he never thought he'd get out in 48 hours. Yes, it is all of our goal to see American troops come home. But we're not going to leave until we know we have accomplished those things. 
So, uh, Rama Kadami, if you can respond to all of that, uh, again, President Trump having recently said he was pulling s U.S. troops out of Syria. Yeah, and this has been U.S. policy. What Nikki Haley just outlined has really mostly been U.S. policy um, since under Obama. Nothing much has changed under Trump in terms of the United States has claimed, proclaimed that, oh, it wants to see and support the Syrian people's revolution, that it wants to see freedom and democracy in Syria, but in fact has really intervened in ways that have strengthened the regime. So its primary goal, the defeat of ISIS, i.e. the war on terror, is really what's brought the U.S. into Syria um, very forcefully. When they started bombing Syria in September 2014, it was against ISIS. And that's been the limit—that's really been where they f focus most their energy. Once in a while, as Trump did last year, as in Trump did this year, they'll bomb a regime target, really an empty airfield, an empty chemical weapons factory, and then say, see, we, sub we want Assad gone. And yet again and again, their actions have proven that, in fact, they want regime preservation. This is not something—they are not really concerned with the Syrian people's demand for the fall of regime. They're concerned with continuing the war on terror, which has been the operation of the United States since 2001, and ensuring that we are con constantly bombing, quote-unquote, terrorists, um, when in reality what the United States is doing, alongside with Russia, alongside with the regime, alongside with Iran in Syria, is the fact that everyone claims that they are fighting terrorists, and what gets lost are Syrian people's lives and dreams to live in a free and democratic Syria. And the number of troops who are already on the ground and the U.S. intervention even until this point of the bombing? The, so there are about 2,000 um, U.S. troops. They are mostly in Kurdish-held areas in the north um, east part of the country, uh, and they've been there to train, really, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are, again, mostly Kurdish groups fighting against ISIS. And the the, the U.S. has been very clear to various rebel groups that it may have sent some arms to or some night goggles to in the past that your primary responsibility is to fight ISIS. We are not concerned with the regime. It is to fight ISIS. And so, again, this kind of the story that we tell ourselves a lot of times in left circles, in anti-war circles, you were talking about how, you know, this weekend people took to the streets to protest U.S. airstrikes. Where, were, where have these protesters been? Since 2012, like I've said, there has been a war going on in Syria. There have been airstrikes going on around in Syria. Since 2014, the United States itself has led a lot of these airstrikes against ISIS forces. But because we have accepted a lot of times that the war on terror is actually a good war, but as long as it's not regime change war, sadly, that's what we see. We see people who will stay si who will go up in arms when the regime might be targeted and then go completely silent when schools and mosques and community centers, Syrian community centers are all attacked by various forces in the name of fighting terrorism. Later in the program, Kudaimi talked about her day job, working for a coalition fighting for the rights of Palestinians. The next day, Democracy Now! hosted Moazem Beg. He's a British Pakistani who had been thrown into Bagram prison in 2002 and then into Guantanamo for a total of three years. After a long outcry in Britain, he was let go. No legal charges were ever filed against him. Now, here's a guy who has every reason to blindly hate the U.S. government and support anyone who seems to oppose it. But he doesn't do that. He talks about Assad and his crimes and those on the left who deny it. I think what's happening in Syria right now is uh, one of the marked uh, periods of our time where we will recognize that the denials that are taking place in relation to the massacres, and not just in Ghouta or in Douma, but in fact what's been going on since the outset of the Assad regime and then his backers in Russia and Iran have been doing literally the deaths of uh, half a million people. Um, today, it, it, 70 years after World War II, still the concept of somebody who denies the war crimes that took place at that time, the Holocaust or the genocides, will and can be prosecuted. But as we speak today, people are in complete denial of what's taking place um, live, though we've got, I mean, if we were just to put aside for one moment what took place in eastern Ghouta, that still leaves approximately half a million people dead. 
So essentially, with the usage of these chemical weapons, everything's being turned on to the discussion about this, as if the United States intervention has made any difference at all. And one thing I have to say, that um, uh, whether it's the United States, whether it's Russia, whether it's uh, the Gulf states, whether it's Britain or France, all have taken part in what I call the aerial gang rape uh, of Syria. Everybody has bombed um, the opposition, and it's only now twice that uh, the United States uh, government has bombed um, Syrian uh, military positions, and this latest one with the chemical facilities. Now, I'm completely against Western inter intervention because I, I, I've tasted firsthand what that can do and what it's done. But if you look at the strikes, literally, I think it's the first time in history that the Americans have bombed over 150 missiles together with the United States and France and killed nobody. Now, at the February conference of 350 Connecticut, Ben Grosscup performed. In addition to being a fine singer and writer, he is the executive director of the People's Music Network. In his 2012 book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, Chris Hedges visits this country's sacrifice zones. The army closed you in as they drove you from the plains. They said the reservation was a sacrifice zone. The company took the uranium, just the fallout remains. They said the reservation was a sacrifice zone. Where your story's been forgotten, we will make it known. Pine Ridge, you are not alone. If this sacrifice continues, will the next one be our own? No more sacrifice zones. No more sacrifice zones. Well, in the 1950s, the U.S. government designated the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation a sacrifice zone. U.S. corporations have long plundered this internal colony for its coal, its uranium, and its wealth. Meanwhile, the average life expectancy for a man is 47 years old. We see, at Pine Ridge, the genocide against our indigenous brothers and sisters is an ongoing crime. But Chris Hedges raises another equally disturbing prospect. That Pine Ridge and the genocide of the First Nations is a template by which capitalism meets out destruction to any people deemed irrelevant to wealth and power accumulation. The coal men blew the mountain, killing everything nearby. They're turning the region to a sacrifice zone. The state refuses to help your people as you watch them die. They're turning the region to a sacrifice zone Where your story's been forgotten Where your story's been forgotten We will make it known We will make it known Appalachia, you are not alone Appalachia, you are not alone sacrifice continues will the next one be our own no more sacrifice zones no more sacrifice zones the rich make voting obsolete as they quash local control they're turning your city to a sacrifice zone 
That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.